Good evening and welcome to another great week of Coach's Corner. My name is Dwayne Dwyer and I go by the Mindset Coach. My name is Uncle Junior and I go by the Consistency Coach. And we are your coaches for Coach's Corner. Listen, um, I think we have another outstanding show lined up for you this week um, because last week was all about inclusive leadership. And I think, as you guys have already seen, this kind of it takes inclusive leadership and kind of expand it. So I'm excited about how we're going to get into this conversation. But before I do any of that, I want to make sure that I acknowledge, as always, how you know awesome it is to be able to share in conversation with my brother here, the Uncle Junior, the consistency coach. So with that being said, brother, how are you doing on this beautiful evening? Man, I'm doing well over here. You know, it's another day, another $7.27. <laughs> and, you know, life is good. You know, life is good. Life is great. Life at the end of the day is what we choose to make of it. There so, you go. That's Absolutely. what it is. I love that perspective. Life is what we choose to make of it. Yep. And with that being said, what I want to say is, as you know, we choose to make these conversations exciting. And I think we have the most perfect people to do so with. Not perfect. just me. Perfect people. There you go. Not just me and my brother up here on the platform, but also the most beautifulest chat uh, that is uh, that joins us. So that being said, I uh, want to make sure that we appreciate you and make sure that you know that you are valued. So please get in there and 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 just say hello, especially if you're new, if you're new to this platform. If you are new to this platform, one of the things that I tend to say is that if you're going to watch and just you know go and do the same things you did yesterday without taking any of the golden nuggets that this young man is going to give to you during this conversation, um, I mean this young man over here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and not take any of that stuff into account. Uh, this may not be the place for you, but if you really want to see some massive changes and massive action happening in your life, then I think you're in the right place. Now, I kind of started off talking a little bit about inclusive leadership because we're kind of going in the direction of including AI into this conversation. So unless you have anything that you want to kind of share with the people before we get started, bro. Man, I want to tell the people what's up too. There you go, my you know, every you know, this is we're in our 20 something show. I think this is show number. I can write it down. I think this is our 26th show so far, you know, yeah. and combine that with what we do on Friday nights and the two years of elevated dialogue. Man, we've been on here for a little bit and we have been, you know, talking, we've been having conversations, we've been getting feedback. And we still haven't ran out of topics. You know, it's a whole bunch of information out there. There are a lot of things to talk about. Um, you and I both use AI, you know what I mean? And, you know, a long time ago, there wasn't AI. And be even before then, there wasn't computers. You know, now here we are over here on the computer, you know what I mean? Talking to people and, and different things like that. And we use AI. So, Again, I guess I just wanted to say what's up to everybody in the chat, everybody who's streaming or, or listening or watching from your device or wherever you may be. I just wanted to say hello, good evening, and I hope that uh, hope that things are going well in your life. Absolutely, man. That 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 is awesome. Um, I great I greatly appreciate it. And man, has it been that long already? Mm -hmm. Twenty episodes. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm exaggerating a little bit, but it seemed like we just started doing this last month. Mm hmm. I'm, I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, man. So, you know, without further ado, man, we're going to kind of dive into this conversation because I'm excited. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm, we're just going to continue this uh, conversation about inclusive leadership. In an era where technology is advancing faster than ever, one pressing question looms for leaders and employees alike. How do we embrace AI and automation without losing the very essence of what makes leadership human? Today's conversation tackles this challenge head on as AI and automation take over more of the routine tasks in our workplaces. Leaders face a critical balancing act, leveraging these powerful tools for efficiency and innovation while ensuring that empathy, trust and personal connection don't get left behind. We'll dive deep into the strategies and insights that will help leaders successfully navigate this new frontier. We encourage you to join the conversation ask your questions and share your experiences in the chat as we explore the future of leaderships in the age of AI and automation. Let's get started in this exciting and important topic. 
So I kind of got into it previously and, you know, kind of mentioned the whole inclusive leadership to include um, to include AI. Um, but I, I think this is kind of interesting. And, and for those people not trying to insult anybody's intelligence, but, you know, AI stands for artificial intelligence. Um, and automation is just simply about being able to connect things um, from a digital standpoint and put it on autopilot like we do a lot of our digital marketing through automation so we will set them up and then they just happen automatically throughout the course of time as we kind of dedicate them so that said bro i want to kind of jump out there with the first question um and, and i think this is going to kind of kick start this in the right direction as ai takes over certain tasks how can leaders maintain authentic human-centric communication and decision making with their teams um, I think one of the things that <clears throat> leaders can do to maintain authentic human centric communication is for once be transparent. And I think, you know, when you're transparent as a leader now, transparency doesn't necessarily mean telling all of your business, but, um, when you, you know, just being transparent about things, like don't, Try to lie about things, just be open and honest and be upfront about things. You know what I mean? Work on trying to build the relationships, um, different things like that, because, you know, as AI takes over and people are starting to go different places for information and, you know, people can figure out the truth about things. When, when someone is working in a company or a team, there's information on the internet about the company, you know? So when you're coming in as a leader and you're not transparent or you're trying to sugarcoat things or trying to hide things from your, your team or not, or not the opposite of being transparent is not being transparent about things. And then you end up with confusion. You end up with a lot of, you can end up with a lot of negative things going on on the team. So I think it's, it's really important that you continue to like build those relationships, be transparent about things. Um, what else did I have? And then I think one thing is um, being an active listener. You know what I mean? Because I think that goes along with it as well. You know, it's easy to grab a device and, and speak to AI or, you know, some sort of software and get information, but it's different when you're having a conversation with somebody. So, I just think, you know, some of those things is what um, leaders can do to help maintain authentic human centric communication. I like where you're going with this already, um, because um, I agree with everything you say, but I want to go a little deeper and a little more specific in certain areas, because I think one of the most important things that leaders can do in the workplace, of course, um, is have a policy, documentation, uh, standard operating procedures, if you will, on how we will use artificial intelligence in our environment. I think a lot of times what ends up happening is that artificial intelligence makes it, sets the condition um, for people to not want to think. Um, and I know that sounds crazy, um, but really, I think that's really what happens a lot of time. So if I have a policy or procedure set in place that says how we can use AI for efficiency, um, because that's really the notion, that's really what it brings to the table. It makes things that we do, um, it allows us to do it in a more efficient manner. Um, so like I give you a perfect example. There was one um, captain I was talking to one day and he said at one point in time, what would take them hours um, as it pertains to writing op orders, um, you know, not just the writing of the document itself, but the planning that goes into it, that time can be greatly reduced by bringing AI to the table. And so you will literally go from, and I'm just hypothetical with it. You can literally go from a 10 hour work, um, you know, 10 hours worth of work on a particular task. It can be reduced to three. Um, now the challenge is, is that you just can't copy and paste it. Right. So that's one of the things that probably needs to go in that uh, that policy or SOP um, so that we understand that AI is extracting this information from someplace on the Internet. Um, so, so just take it, copy it and paste it and put it in. 
um, there could be some issues that come along with that, some legal ramification, um, some non-authentic language that could be used as well that doesn't sound like it will come from our department. Um, it may incorporate some other things. But I don't just want to leave it as a workplace thing as well, because we tend to use it in our own setting. Imagine what it looks like in the home with a family, you know, husband, wife, kids, things of that nature. Well, if, you know, the parents come together and decide, um, and, 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 I'm, and, and I know some people may struggle with this, but the parents come together and decide, you know, how AI can be used. And then they have talks with their children and say, hey, we understand this AI thing is out there, but I don't want AI to um, put you to put you in a position to where you think you don't have to think. Right. Help them to understand that thinking is one of the most valuable things about you. Um, there is. And that's the thing to separate us from other species. Right. Um, so have conversations with people in your household, whatever the case may be, and help them to understand that use AI as a tool, not as the end, not as the end result. Um, and so. The other side to it is that sure, AI allows things to be more efficient, but from a human centric communication piece, just because AI does a lot of the work, we still need to come together and have our meetings in the workplace. We still need to have our family huddles. We still need to sit at the dinner table and, and have open, honest communication. Why? Because there's a whole human being on the other side of that computer that on the other side of that computer that I need to connect with. I need to understand what's going on with that person. And a lot of times what we tend to do is because we have a more efficient way of doing a thing, what we take that as a kind of like a crutch and it allows and we allow it to separate us from the other people. We're still working in a people-centric environment, even though we're using AI as a tool. Yeah, I agree. I think in a sense, it, it, you know, it can make people lazy. You know, I know that <clears throat> I have used it for um, show notes and questions, different things like that. I will say that one thing about it is, like you said, that human element is so important because I go back through stuff and I will look at certain stuff I may have used AI for. And then I go back and look at it and I was like, man, this don't sound right. This don't sound like me. This don't sound like what I would say. So I have to go back in there and, and make adjustments to it to where it sounds like something that I would say. You know, there are certain words that, you know, certain AI systems like to use. And I'm just like, I don't use that terminology. So I usually take things out and put them back in. And then, you know, one thing about AI, especially when it comes to things like this and, you know, chat GT, chat, let me go back to, I got it up over here, chat GPT um, over here. One of the thing about that is that it, you can kind of train it to, to you. But another thing about it is you can also train it to or you can have it respond or answer questions or give you feedback in the form of someone else's like persona or something. So like I've tried it one time, one time I was messing around with it and asked me to give me some questions in the form and respond back um, as David Goggins, Eric, Eric Thomas and Joe Rogan. And all of the responses were different. And it sounded like I was talking to them. You know what I mean? It sounded like what they would say if I was having a conversation. So it was very entertaining. Um, and I think, you know, at the end of the day, just having that human piece right there is, is very important because, you know, even though humans put the information into the AI, when it spits out, it's grabbing so many different perspectives, so many, so much different information from all over the world, all over the planet all over the clouds and everywhere else that, you know, it can sometimes be presented differently than maybe how you would like to present it yourself. So you can't get away from the human element. Absolutely. That right now. A a absolutely. <laughs> and I pray we never do, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that, and I kind of started off with this earlier, keep in mind, it is artificial intelligence. So mm -hmm. the more information you feed it, the more it becomes conditioned to you. Now, here's the challenge with that. Imagine, you know, and I'm just going to use like a thousand people. Um, and we already know that way more than a thousand people use ChatGPT. So mm -hmm. it started off, and I think it started off like at 2.0. 
or something of that nature. Of course, it started with one, which was probably the beta, then it went to 2.0, so forth and so on. Now it's up to four. So you got to realize that these iterations and updates that they're doing to the system is making it more advanced. And so the more advanced it gets, um, the faster it pulls information, the more sophisticated information um, that it pulls, and the more that, you know, the, the more robust, um, the the more robust that it can actually, the more robust database that it has to pull from. So now you're looking at chat GPT, just giving you an answer one day. And here it is maybe a year and a half, two years later, chat GPT can write code. So it's mm -hmm. like, it, it does all of these things because it is learning every time somebody hits a keystroke. Now I'm not trying to, you know, this isn't the thing I'm trying to incite fear. I'm just wanting to be transparent. But keep in mind, all of the intelligences of all these people are feeding into this thing. So it, 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 is very, it is very possible that you are interacting with a system that knows more than you, faster than you, based upon whatever it is that you're working on. And so now, going back to what you said, you went back and looked and said, that don't sound like me. That's the issue that some people will run into, especially those in a business setting. Um, because you will end up producing information that probably came from David Goggins, that probably came from Eric Thomas or things of that nature. Um, so that's why it's important for these SOPs to be established. Sure, get the information and use the information as a baseline for you to put your own voice into it, because that kind of it, it kind of helps um, to you know jog your memory, get certain uh, ideas flowing, so forth and so on. But if you ever use it from a standpoint for just copy and paste, that can be a very dangerous thing to do, especially in the business setting. So I'm mm -hmm. glad you did that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and you said something as well. You said it is, it is, um, and I don't want to mess up your words. You said it, I think you said it doesn't think at least not for now. I think that's what you said. I mean, not without human interaction. I mean, they already put in, they already put chip and I think a couple of dudes already. I know one guy, he already has the, um, what's it, the, the, the Neuralink. Mm. One guy already has, he, he's been on, he was on Joe Rogan. I listened to it. Yeah. But I think they've implanted a second person now too. Mm. I could be wrong, but I think it's at least two people. I think the second guy has a, has a updated, version of the one the first guy has yeah don't you think that can cause some anxiety though i guess it all depends on your your perspective and where you're from like if i'm if i'm looking at myself and i'm a in a wheelchair and i'm paraplegic and this thing allows me to play games and and, and email my my friends or get on tiktok or something then i may be willing to take the chance versus just sitting there, you know, not, not really having a life. So, yeah, not you know, I'm not in that situation, you know, right. so. No, no. And I pray you never be in that situation. Yeah. But no, that what you said actually makes sense. And I just think about, cause remember how, when we, um, the whole internet banking thing started off and how the older generation, like, I'm not doing that. I'm not putting mm -hmm. my banking information online and that, you, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. so I think as technology advanced, I think to some degree you start seeing some fear that may kind of, you know, uh, surface when it comes down to people. So that, I guess that kind of brings me to this, though. How can leaders help employees overcome the fear of job displacement due to automation and instead see it as an opportunity for growth? Because your perspective was spot on. Like mm -hmm. you found an example based upon, you know, me asking you that question. That was a perfect way of saying, you know what, it's not a bad thing. So how mm -hmm. can leaders how can leaders do the same thing with their employees? Well, first of all, we have to understand that there are going to be some jobs that are going to be displaced due to automation. You know what I mean? So just like in the other conversation, you know, oh, what was I saying yesterday? You know, I don't don't worry about it. But anyway, with automation, there are going to be some people who are going to lose their jobs. I pulled some up um, just just to see. Because I was like, what type of jobs are going to be displaced? But I never really looked up anything. And there's a whole bunch of them. And I can see some of them, like travel. Like, think about all of the people who are travel agents. Do we really 
need a travel agent anymore. I can go on AI and I can type in blah, 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 blah. And it can spit me out way more information than a travel agent can. You know, when we're looking at insurance and banking and um, with a retail, you know, <clears throat> they collecting data on like everything we do. Every time I get on Amazon and order something, it, you know, it, it gives me pop-ups and notifications and sending me emails all the time about every single little thing that goes on, you know, and I know they're using some sort of AI to, to capture all of this data and information because it knows exactly, almost exactly the things that I like based off of my spending habits. After a certain amount of time, it'll say, hey, it's been so and so many days. Do you want to order this again? You want to order your CMOS again? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> that's one of the things I order. So I just ordered some today. <laughs> that's why it was on my mind. But um, natural resources, high tech, automotive. You know, I remember back in the day, man, it was a big deal to go get your car um, looked at and checked. But now, you know, they can hook in the device and they can tell you exactly what's wrong with it. Like, just like that, you know? So I think that, first of all, some people are going to have their jobs be displaced. And I think another thing that employees can do is just, again, like I said, be transparent. Hey, look, there's going to be, there's some changes going on in the company. I don't really know what's going to happen. As I get information, I will feed it down to you guys. Um, everybody's on the phone. They looking, they, they see when they see when so-and-so LLC is, is not doing good right now. Like they get information, they get notifications on the company and stuff like this. And, and they know somebody who's in the front office or somebody in HR. So information is around the companies and around the team and around employees all the time. Anyway, you know, I think, you know, if if it is a job or if it is a position that's not going to get cut, then I think or not get displaced. I think it's important that leaders share that information as well. Um, there are some people that may say that. Well, no, I'm not going to go there. Um, but if you are on the side of you in those one of those situations and you are unsure, then, you know, do research, get on the internet, ask, ask your boss, Hey, look, what's going on, blah, blah, blah. And see if there's anything that you can do maybe to learn some better skills or some not better, some different skills that may lead to a different type of position, you know? Um, and I think maybe there are some positions within the company or maybe the company or the leader is offering certain types of training that employees can do to help offset, you know, some of those things, you know, um, I don't know, man. I, I know I said some things, but you know, when you trying to, when somebody has a fear about something, you know, especially in the workplace, you know, I kind of look at it as a, as a leader is depending on what position I'm in, how much of that is my responsibility too. So yeah. that's in the back of my head too, as I've been, as I was thinking about this question. Now, I, I love your um, point of view because you're right. Um, I think a big um, example of what you were saying is the automotive industry. Because at one point in time, the manufacturing, automotive manufacturing was huge. And it was a assembly line of people that were responsible for a particular task on that assembly line. Mm -hmm. And that's where the whole Lean Six Sigma came in and all that great stuff, because their job was to eliminate the amount of uh, deficiencies along that, um, you know, um, to eliminate the amount of deficiencies per unit on that line. Well, then when robotics became a thing where well, you had less people working on the line because robots generally don't make as many mistakes as humans do. Right. That's they can work 24 hours. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so this is a facet of reality. Um, and, and I think one of the things that leaders can do to help people to overcome that fear is to try to help people to overcome complacency. It, you should never be in a job. And we talked about this a little bit last week. You should never be in a job where you're complacent, you know, every day, day in, day out, the same thing. If there is no periodic advancement that you are implementing in your own self, not dependent upon the job to do you and um, advance you, but you doing it for yourself in conjunction with what they're doing for you. And we talked about it last week, and it's pretty much the leader development model, right? 
So you have an institutional aspect of it, you have an organizational aspect of it, but then that bottom portion of it, that's you. And so you have to do something for yourself to improve yourself so that you can advance yourself. If you're dependent upon the job to do it, then in some cases, some people are going to get overlooked. And then as they as they get overlooked, then these this is what's going to happen. They're going to get to the point they're going to be fearful about being replaced by some version of automation, some version of artificial intelligence that can actually do their job better than they can. Look at going to McDonald's. You go to McDonald's, you don't have a lot of people working the registers like we, they used to in the past. Why? Because they now have kiosks. So you go in there and now you order your food at the kiosk. The people in the back automatically um, make it and then they call your name or call your number, whatever that looks like. That is a perfect example of how automation is now, um, you know, replacing uh, these jobs. So, again, the seeing automation and AI as an opportunity for growth, you got to realize and I'm being transparent. It's a twofold growth process that's happening here. You got growth happening from a company perspective, and it's in a lot of cases, growth can happen from an employee perspective, but you have to be on the positive side of change. If you choose complacency in your job, you should not be surprised when you're on the negative side of change, and unfortunately, you end up losing your job because of everything we just talked about. So I know that did not sound comfortable um, as we say it, but this is reality. This is the world that we live in right now. Everything is automated. Everything is, you know, based upon AI and everything is computerized. So if you really want to get to the place where job is the thing that you focus on, um, then, I mean, let's just be honest. The computer industry is not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, I kind of want to go back to how I ended. <laughs> when I said how much of it is the leader's responsibility. Now, fear is, in many cases, self-inflicted. It comes from something. But it's usually, it's an internal feeling. And sometimes it projects itself in a physical form, physical way by, sometimes we get scared and we yell. Sometimes we may, middle of the night, somebody shake, wake up and we swing, you know. Different types of fear. Um, as an employee, I don't think it's my employer's responsibility or job to help me overcome my fear. If I'm on the other side of that and I am fearing the displacement due to automation, then two things are going to happen. I'm either going to Complain about it in most, and here's just two things. It's probably more, but two popular things. Is one is I'm going to complain about it, I'm going to piss and moan about it, and talk about all oh, this job I didn't gave so much of my time to this company, yada yada yada. Or like to the complacency piece, if I'm constantly growing, constantly getting better, constantly you know building skills, building my resume, then I may not have such a fear of the job displacement, you know? So I understand the question and I know we answered it the way we did, but I also want people to understand that in my perspective, it's not up to the leader to make you feel comfortable with as an employee with the possible, the possibility of your job being displaced. You know, I get it. I understand. But that's your fear, you know, and in many cases, if the company is growing and they're going to automation, I may be dealing with my own fear as a leader. You know, how am I going to pay my mortgage? How am I going to pay my car note? And how am I going to pay daycare for my four kids that I got, you know? So I understand it both ways. I definitely understand that. I do think that, you know, when you have good leaders, you know, you have leaders who care. I think that they will do something to help try to soften the blow of a displacement. However, comma, I do not think that it is their 
I understand that there are different types of leadership. So me as a subordinate, I wouldn't expect that from my leadership. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I definitely get that. Um, and I think a thing, something that the leader can do is identify those employees with potential of advancement. Um, and in identifying those employees who have potential, um, you try to set those employees up for success. And that's getting them into that leadership realm, getting them to the uh, training um, that the company may offer, um, you know, getting them to implement some of the new stuff that they learn in the environment when they come back. Um, and then also work with them on some of the things that they're doing to advance themselves. Um, and, and you're right, you know, different styles of leaders, because I think a good leader will actually sit down with said employee and find out exactly what it is that he or she wants to do. Um, as far as what the company is, uh, you know, what the company model looks like. I think that's a big piece that leaders can do to help some of these subordinates. But you're, but you're right. It, it, you know, it, if you just want to come to work and be a decent person and do your job and, you know, sit at your desk and eat your, your you know, you drink your tea and eat your crackers doing lunch <laughs> and go back to work. And then at the end of the day, go home and no more, no less. I mean, that's OK. There are some people who thrive in that. Um, but I don't think for the most part, um, and, and I could be totally wrong. I don't think those people are concerned about, you know, the advancement, automation, losing their job, whatever the case may be. Again, I'm, I, I like to look at the glass as being halfway full as opposed to being halfway empty. Um, but just as well as I said that there may be a great number of people who that's all they're going to do is do their job. They're not going to do no more, no less. And then if they lose their job, they're just going to go find another job. So they're literally doing a lateral transfer with the same skill set. So they yeah. go from this job to this job, not necessarily looking for a higher paycheck or more responsibility, just to maintain getting a steady paycheck so they can keep the bills paid. I, I get it. I get it. And, and it, this is one of those things where you are absolutely right. Me making you feel comfortable about the agreement that you made with the company, that's not my responsibility. Me getting you to do the thing that you told the company that you were going to do, that falls in line with my responsibility. And I will also say it's not really my job to do it. It's just my job to manage it or lead it. Because if you don't do it, they have given me the power to say, hey, this relationship is not working. You've been late for, what was it? You've been 12 minutes late on this day. You've been yep. 26 minutes. <laughs> yep. You know what I'm saying? He's late, so, late. Yeah. So, uh, you know, this, uh, your job is terminated as of immediately. So it's, it's, I, I get it. It's just one of those things. Um, mm -hmm. But looking for somebody to make you feel comfortable is the definition of entitlement. And we should not get a job and then become, you know, complacent and feel entitled in that job after we get it. But from a leader's perspective now transitioning from a leader's perspective, and, I, and I'm looking at different industries now. I'm looking at industries that affect the well-being of people. So it's not so much as, you know, me getting the employees to feel comfortable now. It's me as a decision maker in an industry that involves, you know, your well-being, your health and things of that nature. It's me getting to the point to where I do not disassociate who I am, my character, from what I do for the sake of speed, efficiency, and money. So that said, how can leaders ensure that AI-driven decisions remain ethically and ethical and unbiased, especially in high-stakes industries such as healthcare and finance? Mm. Kind of like the first question about leaving the human element in there. At the end of the day, some human, some leader needs to be flying top cover as far as whatever AI that you guys are using. You know, I think even though we can use AI and we can get to information faster, someone still needs to oversee that. And I think that person needs to be a human. I think that person needs to be a leader. If we're looking at doctors and, and healthcare, I think that you know, back in the day, you know, you go in with certain symptoms and yada, 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 and they key them in and they spit them out based off these symptoms. Garfield probably, Garfield has a runny nose. He's been coughing. He has a sore throat. Based off of this, he probably has a cold. Okay, that's fine. Now they can do all of that 
and it'll it'll tell you it's a, it'll tell you a, maybe tell you a code, what type of code, how long it's going to last. It may spin out way more information. However, someone still needs to QAQC that information to make sure that what's coming out from the AI is what was being taught doing your doctoral program or doing your residency when, where you were becoming a doctor, someone needs to verify that information, you know, and I don't, and I think that's the first step. I think that's, if nothing else, that's what they need to do, you know, cause I've heard some things about how, how great AI can be and in, in coming up with diagnosis and, and coming up with medications and everything right off the bat. I mean, imagine just putting in your three, Going online right now, typing in your 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 symptoms, and then AI spit out everything for you. AI spits out the medication you should take, where you should go pick it up, how far it is away from your what should we call it, the closest doctor. You know, it gives you all of this information, and then gives you a um, a non um, Western style medication. What if it can give you a all natural things as well. You know, someone needs to QAQC that because what if the information in there has been put in wrong and it's saying, hey, well, you should go ahead and take some licorice and now you're eating licorice, but you're allergic to it. So it ain't taking account that you may be allergic to something. So like I said, that's just one of the things, but I think that starting right there and just having, you know, some leader oversee the, the AI that's being used in the company is, is, it's step one. I don't think you realize how much I love your response just now. Like <laughs> as I'm listening to you, cause I, re I remember having a conversation and I can't remember who it was with. And one of the things I said is that if there are natural remedies that exist for some of these things, then, Oh my God, what was it? It was, mm, it was all about, that individual writing you a prescription to go to the grocery store. No, it was um, tart cherry juice. That's what it is. Mm, yeah, you were just talking about that. We were just talking about it. Tart cherry juice. Sleep at night. Help you sleep at night. Absolutely. And it works like a charm. Trust me, I, I do it every night now. But it's it's expensive. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, it's almost like, depending upon where you get it from, like you would pay anywhere from six to 10 bucks for it. And I'm not talking about a gallon either. I'm talking about like a, you know, a small one. But if a doctor knows that that will help me, why not write a prescription and give it to me and say like a WIC voucher and go to the grocery store and say, hey, this is, you know, prescribed mm -hmm. with a doctor like that would be easy to do. So I just yeah. wanted to kind of throw that out there because as I was listening, I like to that, you, it brought that back to my thoughts. But. healthcare is expensive, mm -hmm. extremely expensive. So I think in the midst of insurance, how much insurance is going to pay, lack of insurance, when considering the most appropriate medication for said patient, looking at how they can or are going to pay for. And I'm not even saying what I'm saying right now is, is, is legal or ethical. I don't know. I don't work in that industry, but I'm just thinking about it. Like I can't prescribe the most expensive medication for an individual if they don't have the means to pay for it. Like I know at one point in time, people used to make jokes about Magic Johnson, right? But Magic Johnson, I mean, Magic Johnson money long. Like he can get the most expensive medication there is and be perfectly okay to where the average person probably can't afford it. So that's the first thing that comes to mind as I'm looking at this, because in the field of healthcare, which is a, oh my God, billion dollar industry, right? But everybody, you know, one person for whatever they need, they probably can't afford the best medication. So what they can't afford, you know, that's the medication that they get. So I think that's the thing that, that we have to consider as well. There has to be a human someplace in this chain to make an ethical and unbiased decision. But here's the problem. Every human has bias. So if every human has bias, it becomes virtually impossible to make an unbiased decision, especially if it's a human who is putting information into a system that is giving me the results. Now, if anybody just heard what I just said, I just caused a dilemma. 
And the dilemma has been there. It has always been there. And it's probably not going to go anywhere. Right. So if the person who is inputting the data has a bias, now the data that artificial intelligence now has is biased data. Um, so that's one thing. But I still believe, for, and, and this is just me, glass halfway full, right? I still believe for the most part, good people really want to do good for people. And so with the right people in the right location, um, displaying the right characters, I really do believe that these people can make the most appropriate decisions that will benefit a multitude of people. So when it comes down to health care, I really do want to believe that, you know, there are pockets of great people in these in, in, in this profession that really have a heart to help people. Like it's like going to a, a doctor and sure, you know, all of these systems, ones and zeros. Right. Because that's what that, that's what it takes to program. Right. So ones and zeros and all of these other widgets and and hashtags and all this other great stuff. But really, all of these things that, you know, you put in there gets to the point of spitting out data at a rapid rate. So if I put in five foot, you know, five foot eight um, African-American male, 205, blah, 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 blah. Now, when it starts considering the medication, that kind of helps me with the doses, the, the, the dosage amount, right? So we're going to start you out at this amount based upon, you know, your makeup. Okay, that's great. But now getting into some more important things, some more deep rooted things, right? You look at, now you look at different um, ethnicities, if you will, because some ethnicities um, are affected by uh, some things more than others, like sickle cell. Sickle cell was a thing and I didn't know it until I was in the army. Sickle cell is predominantly found in the black community. I did not know that. Now, I'm not saying that it's only found in the black community because I'm not 100 percent sure. But when I learned that, I was like, whoa, because I knew a guy who was in the Air Force. He wanted to be a pilot, but he couldn't fly because he had the sickle cell trait. And I was like, wow, okay. All of these things, right? When you start lining them up line by line, like all of these things, even though it's all about data, it's all about numbers, it's all about equations, it's formulas and all this other great stuff, there still needs to be a human on the other side that makes the most appropriate decision that is dealing with another human. And I have no response for that. That was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I because I get it. And, and and I think that's where a lot of us, well, I won't say a lot of us. I think that's where when you look out, you see mm -hmm. you, know, you see a lot of that. We'll sacrifice human for money. We'll sacrifice human for prestige. We'll sacrifice human for position. And it's wrong. So when we look at the how, don't forget that you're a human. That's for starters. Yeah. At some point in time, if you're, and I'm just going to use this term, if you are using someone else for your own personal advancement, there may be there may be a time later because karma has a way of coming back around. There yeah. may be a time later where you're going to need another human to consider the fact that, hey, I need your help. But do you want them to kind of mess over you for money, prestige? position <laughs> things of that nature yeah. so i think that, i think that's the key like don't forget that you're human and everybody will always need somebody else i don't care what it looks like right now that's the truth that is yeah. the truth. i'm just waiting to get to this next question you ready for it my bad and... I, got little, hey, I got a little long-winded on it and not that it ain't about being long-winded i peeped over there and i saw it and i i forgot this question was on there and man, what, what what are your thoughts? Can AI help leaders better understand and manage their team's emotional and psycho psychological needs? And if so, how? So the short answer is yes. <laughs> the other answer is this: It is not my job as your leader to manage your emotional and your psychological needs. That is on you as the individual. However, comma, there are different types of leaders. In the military, I think that's a different, I think it's a little different, right? And I think maybe the military, maybe 
police force, maybe firefighter, maybe things to whereas you have to count on somebody um, for your life. You know, in jobs like this, I think it's okay, right? Because if I'm the platoon sergeant and we got to go to we got to go to war for 15 months and come back. Your emotional and psychological needs affect me. If we're working at the plant and you're pushing a button every day, your psychological and emotional needs don't really matter. You get out of here, I can find somebody else to flip these burgers tomorrow. All right? So it don't matter. Now, I'm going to speak more so from a military side of, of the view, military side of the coin or some sort of job like that because that's what the mainly I know. Those are the teams that I know. So I think that one of the things we can do with AI is that with AI, you can help. It maybe can help you organize or like you said before, get to information faster. If I can type in a couple of things on the computer or something like this, and I'm like, hey, I'm having a soldier or I'm having a, um, a, somebody on my team and this is what they're going on. I don't know how to help them. AI, help, what is something I can possibly do to help my soldier get through something, yada, yada, yada. And it could print me out something, again, find top cover, look at it first, make sure it makes sense, and then I can probably get to an answer faster about, a, about some information that I may not know as much about. I've used it before dealing with students because I didn't necessarily know how to engage a student about a certain topic that I was very unfamiliar with. So if you just go into just regular, um, a regular browser and type something, it's not going to give you as good of information as it will if you type it into a certain type of AI. So I've leaned on AI to get information real quick to help deal with people with their emotional, psychological needs. So I think it is one way to get the information faster so you can help a subordinate or help manage your team and you know faster sometimes and sometimes faster is better you know but i just i, I think it can help i got you i got you i got you um unpopular I, response no especially the first part yeah uh, unpopular response no um uh, here here's why i said I'm, I'm agreeing with you by the way yeah i agree that i can get the information faster i can go and yeah I can describe what I observe in my environment and then ask chat GPT, what could this possibly be or whatever version I use. Right. And it can tell me, say, well, this, it could be 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 this. That gets the information to me. Yeah. That's it. That's it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave it right there. That's the information. Yeah. I think a lot of times, and, and, and I've been saying this for quite some while, some time, and I'm going to keep saying it. Um, we are infatuated with information. That's why these uh, AI generated platforms, that's why they make so much money. Information at the speed of light. But the question says to better understand, well, to get to the point of understanding that thing in which I extract it in the form of information must first be analyzed. Therefore, after I analyze the information, now it becomes knowledge. Knowledge does not solidify itself until I practice that knowledge. So there's learning for me that takes place in extracting the information, practicing that information so it can become knowledge, learning from the practice, and then applying what I learned to it so it can become more knowledge. And through multiple iterations of practice, I get to understanding, right? But it said better understand. Mm -hmm. No. Comprehend, sure. Understand, no and manage their team absolutely <laughs> now we're talking a facet of emotional intelligence yeah. and for me to manage another person's emotions i must first know how to manage mine so in this question it does not take into account whether or not the leader has first managed their emotion the leader might be the problem you, you see what i'm saying the leader may be projecting their own insecurities on their subordinates putting their subordinates in a position of discomfort and dis-ease, then now that brings in the healthcare industry again. If you heard what I just said. I just dis that dis-ease, right? Put it together. It's called disease, right? So it's uh, 
it's a thing to where, um, and I heard it a while ago and I thought it was awesome, awesome to have stated that your job is killing you, right? Pardon mm-hmm. my French, but that's what it said. And it, because if you're working in an environment to where it is anxiety over a prolonged period of time, it causes a slow cortisol drip. Well, if you understand what cortisol does, cortisol is a thing that's responsible for fight or flight, fight or flight. Well, fight or flight is responsible for, for pulling the nutrients, energy, and all that stuff from everything else. First place is your, your, your personal defense. So that's why people who are in high stress environments, they get sick quick because of this. So getting off topic, I apologize. However, yeah. managing your team's emotions is a high level of emotional intelligence. That's very hard to do. It's mm-hmm. not so if I can, you, 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 can I depend on chat GPT to make me emotionally intelligent? No, I can't. It's only going to give me the information. And the key for all of this is so that we can understand that that is all AI is. It's not going to make you a super soldier. It's not going to make you a super employer. It's not going to make you a super leader. At best, in a very low um, maturation, uh, a state of maturation, you may use it to make people think you're smart because I can regurgitate the information fast. That's the best a chat GPT can do. But you still have to, um, it's still your responsibility to improve yourself, better yourself, so forth and so on. And unfortunately, as good as the system is, it's not going to assess where I am today versus where I'm going to be next year. It won't do that. It won't do that. So that's that's my response. And I think for the people who are listening, the response that's best for you is found someplace in between what both of us just said. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) I like that. Yeah, man. So so real quick, I want to hit one last question because I really want to get into true, false and multiple guests. Um, What steps can leaders take to create a work environment that embraces AI while still prioritizing human well-being and creativity? Um, I I keep saying um. I think you should use it for what it is and not necessarily to try to replace, you know, use it as a, I think all leaders, I think, I think it's a good thing to use. um, What's the word evolving technology as we progress, because, you know, the kind of how you mentioned earlier about people talking about bank accounts and different things like that, like, Certain things are not going anywhere. You know, we're talking about electric cars right now where at some point we was riding steam engines. You know what I mean? And before then, you know, at some point we was, you know, things were being powered by coal, you know? So it's like, you know, at some point we only had the newspaper and now we then we transition over to the internet. And, you know, now we got things, you know, really fast, you know, shorts that'll spit you out a whole bunch of information in, in 30 seconds or a minute, you know? so technology and ai and all of these different things like this i think for the most part are here to stay and i think that technology is is going to continue to progress and i think that what leaders can do to create a work environment that embraces ai is um it's just by doing that while prioritizing human well-being is prioritizing the human element when it comes to the ai you know like we talked about having AI fly top cover. We talked about having AI into, I mean, having, having human beings fly top cover. We talked about having human beings part of the process, talked about human beings editing information that comes from AI and adjusting. So I think that at the end of the day, you know, I'm looking at the time, so I want to keep it short, but I think that the way we keep, I think the main step that we do is to keep the human element involved in the process, no matter what. Yeah. I, and hopefully I, we get somebody who's unbiased. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, no, I agree with that. Yeah. Um, I'll go back to what I said previously. Um, you need to have a policy or some type of standard operating procedure on how to use yeah. AI within your organization. I still think you still have, you need to have meetings. I still believe you still need to do team um, you know, team development, uh, team building exercises, things of that nature. Um, put it on the calendar, make it a normal routine for you guys to interact, go to lunch, uh, you know, as a team once a week or something of that nature, like do those things so that you can stay in front of your people 
so that they can recognize who you are, understand who you are, understand how you think, understand what your likes and dislikes are as a leader, understand how you receive information better and for you to understand how they receive information better. I think all of those things, I don't think we stop doing any of the leadership things just because AI exists. Again, AI is a tool. You bring it into your leadership environment. You don't take your leadership environment to it. When the tool (laughs) becomes more important than your processes, then the tool becomes the process. But the tool becomes, if the tool is a part of the process, then the process does not change the people. So that's the thing. Hold on. What did you say? If, which part? The tool. Yeah. If the tool, if the process, if you take them now I got now I got to remember how I was like, I need to hear that again. Good. If if you take the process to the tool, then the tool becomes the process. But mm. if the tool is brought to the process, then the pro- the tool only aids in the process and speeding up the process and things of that nature. Wasn't mm. exactly the way I said it the first yeah. time I was doing it. That's how I meant it. Yeah, I got it. I got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. Um oh. The the tool is, yeah, that's what I like, too, the tool. You know, it's just one more thing that leaders can use to add to their kit bag. You know, Um, I think it's a good thing. I I always, I'm going to make this about me right now, but I always enjoy, you know, when I used to hear stuff, hear the old heads and military talking about, yeah, add this to your kit bag. You know, when I was young, I didn't really understand it. But I understand it and value it a whole lot more now because now I really understand what it means, you know, and it's just like, you know, we do the gold nuggets and and different things like that. I think that, you know, just being able to add an extra piece to the pie of life is is always a good thing. So absolutely. Absolutely. And I I get that. Um, And and again, that's all AI is. It's a tool. Nothing more, nothing less. And it's like it's like. And I hate to use this analogy. It's like being a mechanic. Mm-hmm. A brand new tool comes out, and you got the hands. Yeah. So you go get it. When you go get that, you don't throw all your other tools away. No. You, you see what I'm saying? You add it to your tool kit, like you just mm-hmm. said. I think that's an important piece. So mm-hmm. that being said, man, we're gonna kind of get into these because I'm uh, I'm excited about these as well as the um, the multiple guests today. So first things first. One of the ethical concerns with AI is that it can depersonalize decisions, making it important for leaders to ensure that human values remain at the forefront. True or false? My answer would be false. Okay. My answer would just be false. All right. Depersonalize decision. Making it point for these, I sure of it. Yeah, I say that. Yeah, I say false. Is that what the chat said? Probably. I think the chat's gonna get it. But yeah. as they're typing it in, the answer to that one is actually true. It's true. Uh, AI can sometimes make decisions without considering human elements. So leaders must ensure that ethics and human values guide decision making. So that one is true. Um, moving on to the next one. Okay, true it is. <laughs> <laughs> AI can fully eliminate the risk of bias in decision making, meaning human oversight is no longer needed. Oh, that's an easy one. Because <laughs> of that third word. <laughs> oh man, false, false it is. Absolutely, absolutely. It's the old F. Absolutely false. Um. It's uh, AI, actually, AI can inherit uh, or amplify biases from the data it is trained on. So that's the thing. Like, remember, I agree. Yeah, remember, if the person who is putting the data in has a bias, then so does AI. Oh, is a chat GTP is freaking biased. It is straight left wing bias. Is it really? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Play around with it sometime. Okay. Ask some stuff about Trump and ask some stuff about Obama. And, and Biden to see what comes up. It's it's interesting to me. You know, that's that's not the first time I heard that. Somebody said <laughs> that about the what is it, uh, Alexa? They said Alexa mm-hmm. bias as well. That's interesting. I, I don't doubt it. I do not doubt it. You're right. True or false? 
AI and automation are most are most effective when used as tools to enhance human leadership rather than as replacements for human judgment and experience. Mm. I don't think nobody's going to get that one wrong. True. Absolutely. The answer is true. Mm. All right. Moving on. True or false, the integration of AI into the workplace will make traditional leadership values like trust, transparency, and empathy less relevant over time. Mm. I think. <laughs> I got it, man. I got it. <laughs> He's going to make it more relevant. That's what I think. The integration of AI in the workplace will make traditional leadership values like this. No, I think it's going to make it more relevant. I think, I think that more relevant because if people start depending on more of AI, I think you can lose some of that human element. So I think it's more important that you have that trust, transparency, and, and empathy. So you're but, saying, so you're saying the statement is false. Yeah, I'm saying the statement is false. You are correct, sir. Absolutely. All right. Last true false. Leaders should encourage their teams to embrace automation by highlighting how it can enhance creativity and free up time for more complex value driven tasks. Man, I'm going to say false. Really? I'm saying false because I don't know if it's the leader's job. This is going to depend on the, the work setting gotcha. or the environment because it may not be a good thing to embrace automation in certain certain jobs. You know right. what I mean? If right. it's coming, it's coming. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's coming, then yes, embrace it. Now, I do believe that it's a, if it's coming, no matter what, then you have to embrace it. I don't think that if it's coming, you try to shut it off and be like, no, nah, I ain't trying to do with it. Because look how many people say they weren't going to do that with the Internet. And now everybody got a phone with the Internet on it. So right. um, if it's embracing, it's coming down. I mean, if it's coming down, embrace it. Well, so for me, I think it's like. Um, it's like recognizing that you can either like the thing or don't like the thing, but it's still mm -hmm. coming. And not only is it still coming, it's coming fast. It's taking mm -hmm. over. Like literally there's not, you probably can't go a month without realizing that a new website has integrated it into their website. Yeah. So I think with this one, it's just simply saying that instead of having your employers resistance to it, resistant to it, to have them to embrace it, and highlight that it can actually help you do what you're already doing, right? It's not replacing you. It's not doing any of those things. I'm not yeah. even trying to make you feel good about it, but it's happening. So we might as well use it to its advantage. And I'll be honest with you. I was one of these persons because at one point in time, I, I was like, nah, I'm not messing with that. Just the yeah. AI thing, crazy. I'm not doing like, it yeah. until later. <laughs> I was like, okay, I might as well roll with it. I like it. Yeah, man. I All like right, it. Here we go. Sheets. I like anything that make certain things fast, not everything. But see, that's the key. It just enhances what you're already doing and make it faster. You give me time to do other stuff. You know how much time I've saved using AI that mm -hmm. I can go do other stuff now? And you, my friend, just validated the truth of that last question. Mm. There, you yeah. go. <laughs> there you go. All right. Here we go. The project oh, management yeah. dilemma. Maria is a project management at a fast growing tech company. Her team has been integrating AI tools like chat GPT to streamline workflows, particularly in writing project reports, generating data summaries, and even brainstorming ideas for client presentations. Recently, Maria assigned her team a high stakes task to draft a strategic report for an important client. David, one of her team members, decided to use chat GPT to generate a large portion of the report. With deadlines looming, he copied the AI-generated content directly into the document, 
without reviewing it for accuracy or ethical consideration. He submits the report on time, but Maria quickly realizes that some sections contain inaccurate information and others closely resemble content from an online article. Identifying the problem. The first question, what is the most important immediate issue Maria faces regarding David's use of AI in the report? A, the quality of the writing style in the report. B, the potential for plagiarism and inaccurate information in the report. C, David's lack of familiarity with AI tools. Or D, the fact that the report was delivered on time. Um, E, <laughs> which is... Maria can delegate authority, but not responsibility. She should have checked over this before she sent it out. That's the number one issue. However, comma, that ain't an option. So <laughs> since that's not an option, I'm going to go with B, the potential for plagiarism and inaccurate information in the report. All right. You know what, sir? Survey says the answer is B. B is. Uh, the key issue here is that the ethical concern about plagiarism and the accuracy of the AI generated content. Um, again, like I said previously, AI generally pulls a lot of that information off the internet. And especially when it comes down to project management in tech industry, um, some of that stuff um, can be, uh, and, and I think for the most part, you run the risk of tapping into somebody else's information. In some cases may be proprietary, but proprietary yep. information probably won't be on the internet anyway. Yep. Um, all it right. Making workplace adjustments. Which of the following is the best strategy Maria can implement to ensure responsible use of AI tools like ChatGPT within her team? A, ban the use of AI tools altogether to prevent errors and plagiarism. B, allow unlimited use of AI tools, but assign one person to fact check everything. C, establish guidelines on how AI can be used, requiring human oversight for accuracy and originality. Uh, and D, have the team rely solely on AI tools for efficiency and speed. Man, it's an easy one. Anybody who's been paying attention to the show, we've been talking about this the entire time. <laughs> I ain't even see none of this. But I'm going to go with, speaking of, I didn't see any of this. That's my answer, C. <laughs> Let's see. The answer is C. Establishing and, and this is key. I can't stress this enough. Yeah. Establishing clear guidelines for using AI, um, including human oversight for accuracy and ethical consideration, um, is the most balanced and responsible approach. And, and I think it has to be that way. And this can be done kind of like what we talked about the meeting. So you create um, you create the guidelines first. Now the employees are executing and using the tools within the scope of the guidelines. And then you have a meeting to over to to review all of the products before we submit it. So to your point previously, um, one of the biggest mistakes that Maria made is that she didn't review the document before she's the project manager. Right. So she is ultimately responsible, like you said. She yep. did not review it. So good point. Yeah, no SOP. Got no SOP. Mm -hmm. Analyzing potential problems. Okay. If David had cited the online sources that ChatGPT pulled from while generating the content, what would have been the ethical concern in this situation? A, the lack of originality in the report. B, the fact that he used AI to assist in the task. C, the report would have taken longer to complete. Or D, the client might not understand how AI was used in the report. Mm. I think that would be by using the word ethical concern, I'm going to go with a um, lack of originality in the report. But um, honestly, I don't know. But I'm going with a. All right. Survey says a mm. is the correct answer, sir. Um, and, and and I will add to this. It says even with the proper citation, the issue would be the lack of originality. Of course, simply copying and pasting from AI generated content, even if cited, could still raise concerns about the team's critical thinking and creative input. Um, I, I would say the other part to it. I guess you can ask Chat GPT or whatever Gemini, whatever you're using. Um, I guess you can ask it whether to pull the information from it, it would give it to you. Mm -hmm. But again, I, I think the other part to it 
is what if we pre present something that looks just like, you know, like in, in the space of contracting, right? What if my um, submission <laughs> is just like your submission? Yeah. Right? There, there is no originality. There's no, there's no corporate stamp on it that says that this is who we are. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, no identity at all. Yeah. All right, balancing AI integration and human uh, human creativity. What leadership dilemma does Maria face when trying to balance AI integration and human creativity? A, whether or not to fire David for relying too heavily on AI. B, how to ensure AI tools enhance rather than replace the team's critical thinking and ethical decision making. C, how to choose the best AI tool for the company. And D, whether to encourage the team to use AI tools to speed up all future reports. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> I mean, but not A. She don't have a right to fire him because if she didn't have an SOP, or she didn't have guidelines for using it, and she didn't oversee it before it got submitted, and she can't fire him. Um. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> yeah. A, a lot of times what we don't get is that if you did not give an employee clear, concise instructions on how to do a thing, just because you were, you know, uh, because your boss gave you the business, you can't come out and now reprimand this employee because you didn't do your job. Yep. So, okay, yep. so I just wanted to jump in there. I interrupted oh, your show, sir. Please continue. Oh, man, it happened all the time in the military sometimes. But, um... <laughs> Leadership dilemma. She faces a dilemma on whether uh, how how to ensure AI tools enhance rather than replace the team's critical thinking. I think that 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 can be a dilemma because I think that's something that she needs to look at. You know, if she hadn't done an SOP and she didn't QAQC that paper, then I don't know if she really understands everything about AI tools in the first place. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think she needs to relook at that. Um, she may need to look at C how to choose the best AI tools for the company. Maybe that ain't the right one. Um, uh, maybe they should be using this versus that, like you said, Gemini or um, Chat GTP. Whether to encourage the team by using AI tools to speed up all future reports, honestly, I think B through C. I think they're all mm -hmm. dilemmas, they're all things that that needs to be looked at a little bit more. Yeah. So I'm going to go C, B, B, C, and D. Bravo, Charlie, and Delta. I, I don't disagree with your response, right? I, mm -hmm. I think you're right. Um, I think the first one, obviously, is, you know, yeah. the, 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 you know, how to use the tool, like we talked about a couple of different times. But to your point, let's just say Maria herself isn't spun up on how to use it effectively or whatever the case may be. I think this is an opportunity more so than anything. This is an opportunity for the team to come together. And this is now a project that we need to do internally. We mm -hmm. need to look at writing an SOP for the AI tools. Um, and then um, how do we extract the data to help us along the lines of critical thinking and ethical decision making, um, which is the best tool we're going to use. And then she, as the leader, must encourage them to use the tool. Um, because I think it just makes things better. And like you said, it saves time in doing so. So I like your response to be, uh, B through D. So if you mm -hmm. guys answered B only, or you answered B and C or B and D or B, C and D, you are correct. Yeah. And so that, my friend. Because go back real quick, if you can. Yeah. Because I'm looking at, at, the, at, at D, right? Whether to encourage the team to use their AITs to speed up future reports. I don't know. I think I was agree to go somewhere with that, but then I don't really need to. But okay, I'm good. Yeah, and, and and I know it might be a head scratcher on whether or not D is part of the correct answer. Yeah, but again, this is part of 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 the ethical dilemma in creativity too, because you got to realize a lot of times after stuff like this happens, the leader. Uh, might be a little gun shy with the whole integration of AI from that point on. So now it has to be controlled to some metric. And so how do you encourage or whether you encourage or do you just write it as a, a part of the process flow that you're actually going to use? And, and so I think just putting it in the process flow is encouragement by itself. 
What if you realize your team ain't that smart? (laughs) That is a dilemma that's within itself. I'm back to paper and pencil for everything. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) All right, man. Listen, we greatly appreciate you guys staying with us. We know we went a little bit over. um, But, again, we appreciate you and we uh, value you. But uh, this is that moment to where you get to get these actionable steps. I'm on it. I got it. Blow me up. Here's my actual advice for this week. All right. We've been talking about AI, but, and not, but we've been talking about AI and we have been sharing a lot of different things about it. One of the big things that I want to talk about today is from my actual advice is your job or your career. If you have not, what I would encourage you to do, this is everybody, you know, if you if you're working a job, look and see how AI is moving in on your territory or on your job. Look and see. Go out there, look on the Internet, do some research, figure out if whether figure out whether or not your job, your career or the way you earn or the way you're living your life is going to be affected in a negative way by AI. Are you going to be laid off because AI have taken over your industry? If so, if you're in that category, start figuring out how you can navigate when this shift happens. If you're not on that side of it, there may be some other technology that's coming down that may in, um, incorporate some sort of AI or some other evolution of something that may push you out so i would just to ask everybody over the next week just go back and look at the industry you're in see if you're safe see if there's ai coming down the road um that can possibly displace you and if it is go out there and try to learn some more skills or something like that and if it's not then it's not but i also want to encourage people to while they're out there looking See how they can benefit from AI. See if AI can help you take some things off the plate. See if AI can help you um, get more time back in your day so you can spend more time with a loved one or doing something you want to do. So that's my actual advice for the next week. Boom. I love it. I'm I'm still laughing at how he said blow me up. Um, I I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Um, I think if you have not or are not using AI um, currently, um, I think you're missing a very valuable tool that can help you. Um, it doesn't really matter what it is. Just get in there and play with it and try something. And you can use it to create a simple budget for you, and it will help you with that. Um, I think the part I want to focus on is the human aspect. I don't believe we should ever replace the human aspect of our existence, allowing AI to be the primary decision maker for anything that we're doing. So as you're using AI, because I'm going to believe right now that most people are already using it, as you're, as you're using AI, remember to think critically about whatever it is that you're doing. Critical thinking is for problem solving, right? So if you're going to exercise critical thinking then ask ai a well thought out question for it to give you a well thought out response the better the question that you ask and this is just for any interaction whether it's with people as well the better the better the question is the better the response is going to be okay so that's how you use it from a standpoint of critical thinking from a standpoint of creative thinking like give it all of the parameters that you can come up with so if I want to, let's just say I want to build a bookshelf, right? And so I say, look, AI, I want to build a bookshelf and I want to use this. I want to use that. I want to use this. I want to use that. It's going to be two people working on a particular task. These are the tools that we're going to use. So we give it all of the things that it needs and then it does that. And then it tells you, you know, um, whatever it gives you. Let's just say it that way. But let's not forget that it is simply a tool. Okay. so. As it pertains to the tool, you use the tool only to advance. So I said all that to say, never allow it to make you callous to such a degree that you're forgetting 
that you're using the tool to serve people. I want to say that part again, because I think that's the most important piece to it. We use the tool to serve people. Sure, in one aspect is serving me, but more importantly, it's serving somebody else. In my workplace, I'm serving my boss and the people I work with, and ultimately our customers. If I'm a business owner, it's for the customers. If It's whatever. Like It's always for the end user. So remember, it's not AI. AI is not the gift. The people are the gift. AI is the tool that you use to serve the people. And if you keep that in the forefront of your mind, I think we will never get to the place of losing our identity as people in AI. Hey, man, I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation, man. And, uh, you know, like I said, it went a little long tonight, but I think this question, I think this conversation was 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 very good. Is there yeah. anything you want to give to the people before we uh, before we take off? Yes, I want to tell them to go out there and try some tart cherry juice. They need to sleep. They can make the they make the um the pills too, the capsules. So I just looked up, man. But you know, other than that, man, I'm everybody go out there, have a great week. Um, join us on Wednesday. I mean not Wednesday, but on Friday night for an episode of Empowering Perspective. Join us. Um, on Saturday morning for an episode of the Hearts of Women's podcast. And then next Tuesday on another episode of Coach's Corner. So that's all I got. Yeah, real real quick caveat. Um, so the Hearts of Women is the third Saturday of every month. Third uh, Saturday. And, okay. being that, and being that today is the first, right? Mm-hmm. It's going to be the third Saturday of the month of October. So great plug. And I'm glad you did that. Um, but yeah, listen, support, support, support. Uh, we greatly appreciate all your support. I, I don't think you guys understand the energy that you give us just by simply being here. So Ooh, I want to kind of caveat off of what he said. Um, just want to make sure that you guys understand how much we appreciate you. And we so, get real energized when he hit the like button and we get ecstatic when they share it. What he said. He said yeah. it from his <laughs> mouth to our ears. Listen. <laughs> You guys are awesome. Uh, enjoy the best of the rest of your evening. Like my, like my brother said, have a fantastic rest of your week and let the best version of yourself be a blessing to somebody else.